the fourth dynasty of Egypt's Old Kingdom is famous for its pyramid building prowess. Snefru is believed to have built three of these monumental structures in the Maidum Red and Bent Pyramids. His son Khufu built the largest of all at Giza with the Great Pyramid, and Jadefre built his on the highest ground at Abu Ruwash. Khafre's was placed next to the Great Pyramid but on higher ground to look taller, and although Menkore's is smaller, it's arguably the most beautiful to look at both inside and out. But then we have Shepses Kaf, who's believed to be the final king of the 4th dynasty, and for some reason there is no pyramid to his name. He instead built a great mastaba in South Saqqara, which was a departure from the Giza necropolis, but we have to ask ourselves, why? And why break the famous tradition of pyramid building? Well, in this video I'll be taking a closer look. Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe to the channel for regular content on ancient architecture, as well as all of the latest news from the world of archaeology. King Shepseskaf is believed by many to be the final king of the 4th dynasty, the successor of King Menkore. His relationship to Menkore is unknown, he could have been his son or maybe even his brother. We also don't know Shepseskaf's relationship to his successor, Yusakaf the first king of the 5th dynasty. There is a belief there was a pharaoh between Shepseskaf and Yusakaf, and some think it could have been Queen Kenkawas ruling Egypt in her own right for a short time, bridging the gap between Shepseskaf of the 4th dynasty and Yusakaf of the 5th. We do know she was married to both kings, and at her pyramid-like structure on the Giza Plateau, she is depicted in full pharaoh regalia. Whatever the truth, it is believed that Shepseskaf was the king that came after Menkore, and with his monumental structure, he breaks a long and famous tradition of pyramid building. His great mastaba was known as Kebe Shepseskaf by the ancient Egyptians, meaning either Shepseskaf is pure, or Shepseskaf is purified, coolness of King Shepseskaf or the cool place of Shepseskaf. Today it's known as Mastabarat al firon meaning Bench of the Pharaoh, and I have to say, the more I look into this structure the more I'm fascinated. It was recorded by Richard Lepsius in his famous Pyramid List, and it was first excavated in 1858 by August Mariette. It was reported on by Pering, and then fully explored in the 1920s by Gustave Jequier. But it's once again thanks to Keith Hamilton we have all the information regarding this structure in one place. Keith published a guide to this structure back in 2018, and in all honesty, it's the most comprehensive document we have on the Shepses Kaf Mastaba. I've left links to the document in the description below. So, before we start, how do we know the Mastaba even belongs to a 4th Dynasty king? Well, as Keith says, the evidence is mostly indirect. Gustav Shekier discovered fragments of a Dolorite statue, similar in style to the famous statues of Khafre and Menkore that were found at Giza. On some of these fragments there were partial hieroglyphs, including the end of a royal cartouche. The cartouche would only agree with two Old Kingdom kings, Shepseskaf and Yusakaf, and because Yusakaf's pyramid is already well known, it is a fair assumption that this cartouche, and hence this mastaba, belongs to Shepseskaf. In the mastaba's temple area, Jekye found a stela and used it to suggest the cult of Shepseskaf operated here in the Middle Kingdom. The final piece of evidence is how the name of Shepseskaf's royal tomb was written. Most 4th dynasty kings used a pyramid hieroglyph in their monument's name, and here we can see an example of the Great Pyramid, written here as Akek Khufu. But in the case of Shepseskaf's monument, as we can see, the determinative is a sarcophagus hieroglyph, not a pyramid. 
and that is the true shape of this monument. The site of the Mastaba is midway between Djoser's Step Pyramid and Snefru's Red and Bent Pyramids, a once pristine area of land, but why was it chosen over Giza, and why didn't he build a pyramid? We'll get to that later, because first we really should take a closer look at the structure itself. As we can see from this artist's impression, the Mastaba had a very intriguing shape with inclined sides, what appears to be a curved top, and two projections that rise above the structure on the northern and southern edges. In style, it's very similar to the Old Kingdom granite sarcophagus that was found in Mastaba 17, and also the sarcophagus of Nefamat in Mastaba 16 at Maidum, as well as others that have been found at Giza. Both the Shepseskaf Mastaba and these granite sarcophagi resemble the ancient religious shrines of northern Egypt, structures with a vaulted top between two vertical ends. These shrines hark back to pre-dynastic and early dynastic times, with the first known representation on the ivory knife handle of the Metropolitan Museum, where there looks to have been a royal visit to the north by one of the Nakeda rulers, possibly King Nama himself, the unifying and original king of dynastic history. We also see it on the famous Hunter's Palette, and this is dated to a similar time. These shrines were important symbols of Lower Egypt, which early dynastic rulers visited and then depicted to show their rule and dominance over the lands of the north. There were shrines of the north and shrines of the south and royal visits to these shrines continued all the way up to the late period of dynastic history. So, the form of Shepseskaf's Mastaba was steeped in religious significance, but of course he did break tradition and didn't build a pyramid. August Mariette excavated the Shepseskaf Mastaba in 1858, but sadly his notes were not published. All we have are his sketches, and these were published some 40 years later. When Jequier arrived in December 1924, there were no traces of Mariette's earlier excavation work, just mounds of debris piled up near the now closed entrance. It took two excavation seasons to clear the site, and Jequier first published his work in 1928. He gives a detailed layout of the internal chambers, and it does closely agree with the older drawings of Mariette. Marigiglio and Rinaldi were the next to examine the structure, and they do give a fantastic account of their findings. If you want to understand the finer details, again I'd like to refer you to Keith Hamilton's guide, but I've pulled out some key points for this video. For a start, and as Keith says, even today there is still no real detailed survey of the Mastaba, and the lack of work at the monument to the last king of the famous 4th dynasty is as bizarre as it is disappointing. All we really have is historic reports, but we do have the brilliant Aceda project to thank for dozens of fantastic photographs, and I've left links in the description below. So, to the structure. Although unconfirmed, the Mastaba is said to be 99.6 metres long and 74.4 metres in width. The inclination of the sloping sides is also not clear. Jequier measured the angles on 60 different casing stones, and this angle varied from 61 to 69 degrees. But it is also thought the casing stone blocks may not have been laid horizontally, but they were actually inclined so we can't just simply measure the angle on the block and get a specific idea of the inclination of the sides of the Mastaba. More work does need to be done. Pering believed the east and west faces had a steeper angle of 65 degrees, with the north and south being 61. But these measurements simply come from measuring the top and base of the Mastaba's nucleus, so we don't really know for sure how accurate it is. 
Some casing stones were found to have curved surfaces, and these are thought to be from the curved top of the Mastaba. Perring said the height of the structure's nucleus is 17.2 metres, with the end parapets being 18.4 metres in height. Perring also knows that these parapets were 7 metres in width. The core of the structure was built as two steps, both of five courses, with each course being made of blocks of limestone. The stepped core was actually not in contact with the casing stones, with the space between being filled with irregular blocks that were mortared together, like what we see when analysing the great scar on the northern face of the Pyramid of Menkore. If you want to learn more, please see my earlier video on this subject. I've left a link below in the description. The casing stone arrangement doesn't perfectly follow the line of the nucleus, implying the stepped core was built first and the casing stones came later. Around the base of the Mastaba, the casing stones rest on a pavement of fine white limestone. In this picture, we can see the paving slabs lying on a much coarser foundation platform. Fragments of granite have been found cemented to the pavement, which leads some to believe the first course of casing may well have been granite, like what we see at the Khafre Pyramid at Giza. I believe that this hard granite first course was to protect structures from flash floods, and these have been noted after torrential downpours in Egypt. So, that's a brief look at the exterior, so what about inside? The entrance is shown here at the bottom of the breach on the northern face, today protected by a steel gate because it's not open to the public. Actually, this picture is 10 years old. Here we can see a more recent picture, and it really is quite a disgrace to see it like this. It's filled with rubble most likely to stop people getting inside illegally, and this means that nobody is getting another look inside anytime soon, even though this would be a fantastic tourist destination. Clearly, the authorities don't agree. So, as stated, it really is an enormous thanks to the Aceda Project, who have photographed the structure both inside and out. The pictures they took a number of years ago are priceless. This large breach, measuring 4.5 metres in width, may not actually be the work of robbers. According to Dieter Arnold, sometimes it was necessary to keep gaps in the masonry, to provide access for the workers, and also to permit the delivery of building materials. These gaps were generally closed up on completion of the structure, so it's possible that in the case of the Shepseskath Mastaba, the structure was just unfinished, and the gap was not properly closed up. But, in truth, we really don't know. But having this gap above the entrance on the northern face does make me wonder about the new North Face Corridor recently discovered by the Scan Pyramids Project in the Great Pyramid. Did they have a similar function? I'll discuss this more in a future video. The Mastaba's chambers and passages were built into pits, and upon completion these pits were filled with fine limestone. The area was then covered with large blocks of fine Chura limestone, rising to about 6 to 7 metres above ground. It may have been T-shaped, following the positioning of the passages and chambers. Here we can see into the breach, and that back wall may be the outer vertical fine limestone wall of the inner structure. So now let's go inside. The entrance passage is said to be in the centre of the north face, and it is thought to have exited the casing stones around 5 cubits from the ground. We can see the passageway is made up of large blocks of granite, resting on a limestone foundation that forms the floor. The shaft is 1.1 metres wide and 1.27 metres in height. Originally 21 metres long, today only about 17 metres of this passage survives, which is angled at around 23 degrees. 
a large portion of the ceiling is missing, with only around 7 to 8 meters intact. In this picture, we're now at the end of the descending passageway, about to enter the vestibule, and the portcullis is directly ahead. The vestibule at the end of the descending passageway measures 2.67 meters long north to south, 1.88 meters long east to west, and is 2 meters in height. From this space, the passageway continues south in a horizontal fashion for 19.46 meters. Large blocks of granite have been used for the walls and ceiling, but the floor remains as limestone. Heading through the horizontal passage, and you reach three vertical portcullises, and these are made of large slabs of granite, the first being 16 centimeters thick, and the second and third being 25 centimeters in thickness. The portcullises were found half lowered, or you could say half raised, and because of this, Jequier thought the tomb was not used, but I think it is more likely the portcullis blocks were raised by ancient tomb robbers. Here we can see stones inserted into the slider recesses, holding up the granite portcullis blocks. At about 8.4 meters into the horizontal passage, and after the portcullises, the height of the passage rises from 1.26 to 1.84 meters, allowing you to stand up inside. It continues like this for 8.16 meters, before reducing in height again for the last 2.9 meters. And then we reach the antechamber. We're now inside and looking to the west, and that there on the northern wall is the opening to the horizontal passage we've just seen and this opening in the western wall leads directly to the burial chamber. The antechamber measures 8.31 by 3.05 meters, and the walls and ceiling are made up of large blocks of granite. The walls consist of three courses of stone, with a fourth course of granite for the tympana. Interestingly, only the tympana blocks, those with a triangle face, have been dressed. The rest of the wall blocks are undressed, and hence unfinished. No floor slabs have been laid, and only the underpavement of white limestone is visible. There is still a building line on the walls, and this shows the intended floor level. There is also an inscription above the line, repeated three times, twice in the antechamber and once in the burial chamber, and it translates to, quote, upper side of the paving stone, true line, end quote. It is thought that the floor would be made of granite, although of course we don't know. In this view we can see a granite block in the antechamber. It's possible that this was a blocking stone for the burial chamber directly ahead, although we don't know with any certainty. Originally, a sarcophagus would have sat in the burial chamber to the west, and fragments were found on the western side of the chamber, but these were since moved to the antechamber. The entrance into the burial chamber is 1.13 meters wide and 1.25 meters in height, and it was inclined downwards. The burial chamber, like the chambers and passages we've just seen, is made of granite. The curved granite ceiling is reminiscent of the burial chamber in the Menkore Pyramid, and therefore shows clear continuity from structure to structure, and from king to king. The granite is mainly undressed. It looks as though the final dressing had begun in the northwestern corner, at around 1 meter from the floor, but of course the work was far from completed. Some of the granite blocks used in the burial chamber are enormous, and we can see both vertical and trapezoid joints on display. The walls rest on a limestone underpavement, remnants of which can still be seen, and although we don't know for sure, it's very possible a granite floor was planned to go on top. Here we can see the line on the walls that denotes the floor level, and this is one of the inscriptions I just mentioned. As stated, fragments of the sarcophagus were originally found at the western end of the burial chamber. 
The black stone of the sarcophagus is either basalt or possibly grey wacky. It's hard to say from just looking at pictures. The fragmented nature of this stone doesn't tell us a great deal, but we do learn the sarcophagus was around 22 centimeters in thickness, and it looks to have been undecorated and uninscribed. Back to the antechamber, and here we're looking at the eastern end, directly opposite the entrance to the burial chamber. In the southeastern corner we can see another entrance, this time leading to the niche chambers or magazines. This entrance is just 81 centimeters in width. At the opening, there looks to be a hole in the floor, and this would be for a hinge, and so it is very possible a wooden door was fixed into position. A wooden lintel would have also sat above this opening. The corridor runs south for 10.65 meters. The floor is around 12 centimeters lower than the floor of the antechamber, and the height of the corridor varies between 1.5 and 2.3 meters. There are four magazines or niches on the eastern wall, and just one niche of a different shape on the western wall. The corridor extends past the last niche for around 1.5 meters, and this basically creates a sixth niche. The corridor walls, ceiling and lintels over the niches are all granite, with fine limestone used at the very southern end of the corridor. Why Old Kingdom Pyramids and this mastaba had magazines is not known with any certainty. Some say they held statues, but others say they were storerooms, holding provisions for the king. Others think they held the king's internal organs as well as his crowns. Sadly, apart from the sarcophagus fragments, no ancient artifacts were found inside the Shepses Kaf Mastaba, and we don't even know if this sarcophagus was original or a later edition. We don't even know for sure that these fragments belong to a sarcophagus. Back outside, and just like the Old Kingdom Pyramids, this mastaba had an associated temple on its eastern side, as well as enclosure walls and also a causeway. Whether or not there was ever a valley temple we don't know, no excavation work has ever taken place, but because we can trace the causeway for a long distance, I would say it is a fair assumption that a valley temple once existed. I'll discuss the associated structures in a future video, because for now, I just wanted to give you a grounding for the structure itself, because the big questions still remain. Why didn't King Shepseskaf build a pyramid? And why didn't he build a Giza? Well, this is where the scholars all seem to disagree. Some say there was no obvious plot of land at Giza, and so Shepseskaf chose a site not too far from Dashur where the founder of the 4th dynasty, King Snefru, built his pyramids. But Giulio Magli believes the plot chosen was highly symbolic. He notes that if you draw a line starting from the half distance between the two Snefru pyramids to the centre of Shepseskaf's tomb, and then extend the same line northwards, it reaches a ridge of the Saqqara Central Field in the entrance area located near the Teti Pyramid. Magli says, quote, As a result, anyone reaching the summit of the ridge would have seen and can still see the king's tomb, due to its bench aspect, forming a sort of regular baseline for the double mountain symbol created at the horizon by the two giant pyramids of Snefru. End quote. Magli believes that by placing the tomb where he did and creating it the shape he did, Shepseskaf, in effect, completed the sacred landscape that was built by Snefru, establishing in his own way, his own power and conveying a message of order, whilst closely aligning himself with the founder of the 4th dynasty. But some say the reason for the change in burial structure, and also the change in location, was all because of a power struggle between Shepseskaf and the priests of Heliopolis at the end of the 4th dynasty. Some say the divine monarchy was beginning to crumble, and that the divine kingship and royal authority were in decline, and so, as a way to reject the priesthood, the king changed the form of his royal burial structure. 
the pyramid was shunned in favour of the symbolic ancient shrine of the north. At the same time, he chose a new plot away from Maidum, Dashur and Giza. But not everyone agrees there was any kind of power struggle, and we know the court of Shepseskaf did continue after his death up until the 6th dynasty, and even into the Middle Kingdom, and some say the New Kingdom as well. The chamber design for the Mastaba was also pretty much the blueprint for the later 5th and 6th dynasty pyramids, starting with the Pyramid of Yusukaf in the 5th dynasty. Furthermore, as we can see with the form of the burial chamber, and also the magazines, there is clear continuity between the Menkore Pyramid and the Mastaba of Shepseskaf. Well, internally anyway. Therefore, it doesn't appear as though Shepseskaf was any kind of heretic. In some respects, it does seem to follow suit. But the reason for the change in location, and also the change in the type of structure, may be far simpler than any explanation I've said so far. We have to note that Shepseskaf reigned for less than a decade, somewhere between four and seven years. It is thought by some that he was well advanced in years when he became pharaoh, and he could have also been in ill health. So, we have to wonder, due to the length of his reign, did he know we didn't have that long? Did he know there was not enough time to build a pyramid, that there was a good chance he could die long before a pyramid could be completed? I do think it's possible, and so we could well have settled for a much simpler design. The location he chose was also practical, not necessarily heretical. It was in close proximity to limestone quarries, and it was also pretty close to the pyramids of Snefru. And so the location of the Mastaba is not really out of the ordinary. The problem with all of this though, the idea that Shepseskaf went for an entirely practical approach to his monument, being smaller and less complicated than a pyramid, and close to limestone quarries, is the huge volume of Aswan granite used in the project. We have granite line passages and chambers. The internal use of granite seems more prolific than the Great Pyramid, Khafre Pyramid and Menkore Pyramid, and this granite is not sourced locally. It had to have come from hundreds of miles away in Aswan. And so, why would Shepseskaf commission such a large quantity of stone from far away if the goal was to complete the Mastaba quickly and efficiently? Well, maybe he didn't. What if the granite came from another project he was already working on, one that he was tasked to finish? Yes, the pyramid complex of Menkore, which experts all agree was unfinished when the king died. And what strange thing do we notice about this pyramid? It was only about a third cased in Aswan granite, with the upper two thirds changing to Chura limestone. Now this is purely opinion based, but would Menkore really have planned his pyramid to be red and white like this? Wouldn't it be more spectacular to have a completely red granite pyramid? I think so, and as Menkore died early, could Shepseskaf have taken the remaining granite from Giza to South Saqqara and used it for his own monument of resurrection, and then finish casing the Menkore pyramid in Chura limestone? This week I mentioned this idea to Keith Hamilton, but he was of the opinion that the red and white pyramid was finished by Menkore himself. This is because Keith was of the opinion that if Menkore died before casting was complete, it's more likely that Shepseskaf would have left part of the pyramid uncased. But Shepseskaf certainly finished the temples in the pyramid complex, and we know he did use a large amount of mud brick in this work, to get the job done cheaply and quickly. And so we could still have taken large amounts of granite, the stone that was planned for the associated structures in the pyramid complex. This is something I'll discuss in a future video, but I do think it is likely that Shepseskaf took Menkore's granite and used it for his own mastaba, 
and that's why we see these marvellous passages and chambers, even though they did remain undressed. Because of our love for Old Kingdom pyramids, it's easy to overlook the Shepseskaf Mastaba. It may not look all that spectacular from the outside, but think about it. Imagine when it was complete. A structure styled as a giant shrine of Lower Egypt, and hence like an enormous 4th dynasty sarcophagus, and if Giulio Magli is correct, it completed the sacred landscape of Snefru. And when we look at it this way, well, it is unique and certainly iconic. Furthermore, the interior was arguably the very best of any structure of the 4th dynasty, being granite lined throughout. And what's more, the layout pretty much became the template for all future pyramids of the Old Kingdom. Shepseskaf may not have been king for a long time, his legacy is certainly overshadowed by his predecessors, but he did create an iconic structure, and one that should never be forgotten. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.